hope you have your Bible with you today. Look, turn to the book of Matthew, first book in the New Testament. First book in your New Testament, the book of Matthew. And today we're going to be looking particularly at chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. There is so much that God says to us in the Bible about fearing God. That it surprises me that anyone who claims to believe the Bible as the Word of God would have a problem with the concept of fearing God. And yet when you come to the topic of fearing God, you need to understand there is all kinds of controversy. Even in the religious world. About the concept of fearing God. Now, Jesus knew more about it than anybody. I want you to look at what He said. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So why should fearing God have any type of controversial element involved in it when Jesus made such a clear statement? The Son of God made it so clear. Fearing God is not only controversial, it is very unpopular in our country, in our culture. It, it is no longer a popular concept to fear God. The news media constantly is belittling God and His Son and the Bible. There is nothing that is sacred in this country any longer. Even movies are made in this country that are blasphemous toward God and His Son in a land that prints Bibles more than any other place in the world. Yet these movies are made year after year that are so blasphemous to our God and to His Son. I remember a few years ago watching the television set when a United States president, most powerful man in the world, took the name of God in vain in front of all the American people, in front of all the world. Now he said... He didn't know the mic was on. He didn't know his microphone was turned on, is what he said. But he made no apology. He made no apology to God, whom he had just taken his name in vain. And he made no apology to the American people. It's as if they didn't need one, and most people probably didn't. Most people probably still don't care. Even some religious people don't care. There is not enough fear for God in the American culture. Now, what did Jesus mean in Matthew 10, 28? I want us to try briefly in this lesson to try to take this verse apart and see exactly what Jesus 
was wanting the original people that he was speaking to to understand. And then I want us to try to understand what it means for us. Is there anything in this verse that means you need to make some changes in your life? Is there anything in this passage that means there's some things in my life that I need to change? To understand any passage in the Bible, first, you must understand the original setting of the passage that you are studying. We're studying Matthew 10, 28. To understand Matthew 10, 28, we're going to have to understand the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 10. That's the original setting from which these words were spoken. To understand these words, you must understand the original setting. You must understand the context. So let's hurriedly look at the context. Matthew chapter 10. First four verses. You remember that Jesus had many disciples from all over Palestine who came to follow Him. But from these uh, disciples, Jesus chose 12 men that He designated apostles. Apostles means one who is sent. Apostolos in the Greek language. One who is sent with the idea with authority. Verse 1 through 4. Jesus tells us the names of those 12 men that He chose to be His apostles. After he goes back to heaven, these men are going to continue his work on the earth. Verse 5 through 7, Matthew 10, 5 through 7, he sends these apostles out. He sends them out. And look at verse 5, he says, Don't go in the way of the Gentiles, don't go into the cities of the Samaritans. I want you to go, verse number 6. To the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew 10 verse 6. This is what we refer to as the limited commission. Because it's limited to the Israelites. Now keep your hand right here and look in Matthew chapter 28. The last chapter of the book of Matthew and verse number 18. Matthew 28 verse number 18. Jesus came to His disciples and He said all power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, even to the end of the world. But notice, this is to all. Go teach all. This is why we call this the Great Commission. Because it's for the whole world. But now back to Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 5 through 7. This is not for the whole world. Jesus said, I want you to go to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. Verse 6. Verse 7, what are they supposed to do? Matthew 10 verse 7, what are you supposed to do? As you go. Preach. What are you supposed to preach? You're supposed to say to those lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 7, you're, you're supposed to preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 10 verse number 7. So he sends them out to preach. And look what a great message they have in verse 7. These people have been waiting for the kingdom for hundreds of years. The Old Testament had prophesied in Daniel 2, verse number 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. They've been waiting for this kingdom for hundreds of years. And Jesus sends out His closest followers, His apostles, and He tells them in Matthew 10, Verse number 7, you go out and tell those people the kingdom of heaven is upon us. Exciting message. 
Wouldn't you think they'd be so glad to hear this? You'd think. Wouldn't you? But Jesus wants them to know. You're going to go out and preach this message. And in verse number 8 and following, you're going to be able to do all these miracles. You're going to be able to heal the sick, raise the dead, do all these wonderful things. But Jesus wants them to know, even though they have a wonderful message, the greatest message ever given to man. In verse number 22, look what He says to them. You shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. Matthew 10, 22. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Why did he say that? He's going to explain to them in this chapter. There's going to be problems. Look at verse 16. There's going to be problems. Matthew 10, verse number 16. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. You're going to go out and preach this wonderful message in Matthew 10 verse 7, but I want you to know in verse 22, you'll be hated for what you preach. And I want you to know you will have enemies who will despise what you say. And some of them in verse 16 will be wicked. Some of them will have hearts that are hard. Some of them will be like wolves. What's the nature of wolves? To tear to hurt, to destroy. I want you to know. He wanted to prepare them for what was coming. He wanted to forewarn them. Though they had a beautiful message, He wanted to forewarn them. Persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 All of them that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He had warned them earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 in verse number 10 Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice at being exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He had already warned them, but here in chapter 10, He's going to warn them again. He said, you're going to be sent before kings and before councils, and they're going to persecute you. And He said, when they persecute you in this city, go to another city. Well, if their message was so beautiful, how do you explain this? If they have the greatest message that's ever been given to humanity, why are they going to have these problems? Verse 34. I believe a lot of Christians have never read this verse. Either that or they don't believe the Bible. I'm tired of messing around with it. Let me tell you something. Look at this verse. This is the verse of Jesus. This is what, and look what he said. Do not think that I have come to send peace on the earth. Some people, all they want is peace. Nobody's complaining, haven't heard anything bad. That's the number one work of some leaders of the church. Just keep everybody happy. Don't rock the boat. Don't get, don't get people nervous and excited. Do not think that I came to send peace on the earth. Do you believe that verse in the Bible? Oh, sweet little Jesus. 
What about sweet little Jesus here? Don't think I came to send peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, what does that mean? He explains it. He explains it. Father will be divided against Son. Verse 35. Daughter against mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. My words are going to bring problems. Verse 36. A man's foes shall be they of his own house. Beautiful message they have, but Jesus prepared them. It's not going to be a yellow brick road when you preach My Word. It's not going to be a bed of roses when you tell the truth to people. It's going to bring division. It's going to divide families. As a young child, I saw my own precious family divided by denominationalism. Each one of us in the family was a different brand of religion. Divided our family. I thought even as a child, surely this is not what God wanted. I didn't understand Matthew 10, 34, 35, 36. I'd never read it in my life. Of course, that's not what divided my family. What divided my family was religious tradition, not the Bible. But when you preach the Bible just like it is, you're going to make folks angry. It's going to divide people. Because some are going to accept it and some are not going to accept it. Even in the same family, you're going to have it. Look at 22. Jesus didn't want to mislead them. He he didn't want them to think it's going to be something it's not. He said, you'll be hated. (laughs) So what did He tell them? 26, don't fear. He's preparing them. Don't fear, 26. 28, don't fear. Matthew 10, 26. Matthew 10, 28. Now look at Matthew 10, 31. Fear not. There's three times that He tells them, don't be afraid. This is going to happen. Don't let it bother you. Don't be afraid. I mean, if the Master was hated and persecuted, what about those who are doing His work? If the King of kings and the Lord of lords was hated and despised by men, what about those who are trying to do His work? Shouldn't they expect the same treatment? We have it too easy in the U.S. of A. We're too comfortable. We're too comfortable. We don't want that comfort We don't want that bothered, do we? We don't want that bothered. We want everyone to like us. Shake everyone's hand and everybody just pat us on the back. Well, that's not the way it's going to be if you really live for the Lord of the Bible. Jesus said you'll be hated. Matthew 10, 22. Then he comes to verse 28, and what's the point? What is the point he's making here? Well, remember, he's sending them out. He's warning them about all of these problems. And verse 28, he's given them a prescription for comfort. He's forewarned them of all these problems, but in 28 is actually a prescription for comfort. Don't fear those people. 
Yes, they're going to bring you before kings and councils. They're going to persecute you. They're going to kill some of you. It's going to really be hard. Don't be afraid of those people. Don't be afraid of any man. Why? Because verse 28, Jesus said, their power is limited. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. There's just so much they can do. This is the limit of their power. This is the extent of their persecution. They can take away our physical life, but they cannot touch the spiritual part of us made in the image of God. They can take away our physical life and then our spiritual true lives are with God for eternity. And we place more emphasis on this physical life than on this spiritual life that will be here forever. We're more concerned about the physical things of life that are temporary than the spiritual things of life that are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 18, Paul says, We look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Are you more concerned about this life, about what people think of you, and your friends, and your little life, are you more concerned about that than your eternal welfare? This life is only for a moment. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. James 4.14 Your life is so brief, and then you live forever. And you're more concerned about this puny life? than your eternal welfare with God? You're more concerned about what your friends think than what God thinks? You don't want your friends to frown at you, but you don't care if God frowns? Look what he says. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of those people. Don't be afraid of the devil's children. Their power is limited. My power is not limited. All they can do. This is it. The most merciless tyrant. This is the extent of what he can do. But rather, never fear men. Always fear God. Let not, th let not the people of God think that they do not need a holy fear of God to restrain their behavior. Oh, if you love God enough, let me tell you something. Every child of God needs the fear of God to restrain certain behaviors. And there's nothing else that will do it. That's why our country is in turmoil, ladies and gentlemen, because our country, most of our citizens no longer have a fear of God, so they have no restraints. They go out and shoot one another. They go out and rape one another. They go out and destroy one another's children. Why would people do this? Why would people hurt a little child? Because they have no fear of God. They have no fear of God. How could anybody think the fear of God is not essential? It's all through the Bible, not just here. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13, after Solomon went through the whole issues of all of this life, he said the conclusion of the whole matter, this is what life is all about. 
fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of God. We need men and women who are sitting as judges who fear Almighty God. When we have a judge who has no fear of God, he will allow the pedophile to go free. He will allow those wicked people who hurt our children to walk our streets and be on probation and do it again and again and again. Why? Because that judge has no fear of God. Apparently no fear of us because we'll just elect Him again. Because He helps our economy. Fear of God. We need it in presidents. We need it in congressmen. We need it in senators. We need it in judges. We need it in Christians. We need it in preachers. We need it in elders. We need it in deacons. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. We need the fear of God and the beauty of holiness. Look what he said. 10.28 Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Now the materialist, the Jehovah's Witness, they believe that once you're dead, that's it. You're annihilated. That's all. And when punishment comes on judgment day, it's just a moment of punishment and then you're annihilated. Look what this says. This destroys that complete concept. Look what he said here. Do not fear the one who can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Now if you're Jehovah's Witness or materialist believe that way, then you believe when the body's dead, then the soul is dead. That's not what Jesus said. They can kill, they can take away physical life, but they cannot kill the soul. That's what Jesus said. They cannot kill the soul. Jehovah's Witness say when your body's dead, your soul's dead, you're, it's, it's over, you're gone. Jesus said when they kill the body, they can't. Touch the soul, the eternal part of man. And it's not just your breath. It's made in the image of God and it lives forever. And it goes on to live. Jehovah's Witness grab this verse and say, Look at here, God can destroy the soul. They say that means annihilate. Destroy doesn't mean annihilate. It means to bring to eternal ruin. Matthew 25, 46 is what it means. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 46. That's what Matthew 10, 28 means. When he destroys the soul, it doesn't mean he annihilates the soul. It means the, he said, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. The body and the soul can be tormented forever and ever. Because we, do, we don't accept God. Because we believe in some religious tradition that's not in the Bible. Oh, I've always believed this. Don't talk to me about it. Friend, you better let us talk to you about it. We're talking about a place called hell where your soul is on the line. You will be there forever and ever and ever in conscious torment if you do not accept the mercy that God extends to you today. Nobody wants to go to that place. And let me tell you, nobody needs to because God has provided a remedy. 
He's provided His grace, and through His grace, He's provided a plan where you can escape this horrible place. You believe in Him. You repent of your sins. You confess His name and you be immersed in water, not sprinkled, not poured by some priest or some Protestant pastor, but you be immersed in water to have your sins forgiven and all of your sins will be gone. And you don't have to go to this place that Jesus is warning you about in Matthew 10.28. Come to Him now. 